Okay, well, every blessing to you all, and welcome back to my Open Air Pulpit. As you know, I've been working my way through the uh, book of Genesis over the past few weeks, and incidentally, this coming Sunday, Lord willing, I will hopefully complete 2 Corinthians chapter 1. It uh, will be a three part uh, study looking at uh, chapter 1 from uh, 2 Corinthians. Please excuse me whilst I <laughs> get my uh, script ready for today. So please join me, as always, 11 a.m. Sunday morning UK time. That's 11 a.m. every Sunday morning UK time. And Lord willing, like I say, I will aim to complete 2 Corinthians chapter 1. But last time we were able to complete our look at Genesis chapter 17. So let's continue, if we may. And uh, for today, let's start in Genesis, chapter 18, verse 1. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door, and bowed himself toward the ground, and said, My Lord, if now I found favour in thy sight, Pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Well, of course, Abraham is a type of Christ. Abraham is a prophet. Abraham is a mediator. And here, Abraham, initially a Gentile, but now has become a Hebrew, has been able to witness three people from uh, verse 2 coming his way. If you speak to the Mormons, they will have you believe that he saw the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I don't believe that. I think it's more likely that he saw Jesus Christ, and we refer to such as a Christophany, or a Theophany. Theo being Greek word for God. God in the flesh, or Christ appearing in the flesh, pre his, his uh, incarnation. So for me, it's more likely that Abraham saw Jesus and two angels. We know from 1 Timothy chapter 6 how no man has yet seen God the Father. So Abraham, as I say, has been able to see Jesus Christ in spiritual form, not yet incarnated. That wouldn't take place until the New Testament, of course. And he is joined by two individuals, two angels. And he says from verse 3, My Lord, now my King James Bible, the L is capitalized. And I'll come back and further discuss that later. We look at Lot. If now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, pass not away, I pray thee from thy servant. That's a picture of humility. Abraham would be the father of many nations. His wife Sarah would be the mother of many nations. It starts with Adam and Eve, and of course they were told very clearly not to eat of the tree of life, and they took of the tree of life, and they died spiritually. There was no way back for them. You could suggest, perhaps, that when the Lord killed an animal and gave them a covering, that that was a picture of imputation. And I hope, I really hope, that Adam and Eve were saved. I don't know, but when you go to Genesis, make that Revelation, excuse me, when you go to Revelation, like the last chapter, the warning has been given that if you take from the Word of God or if you uh, subtract from the Word of God, if you mess around with the Word of God in any way, shape or form, you uh, lose your place in the Book of Life. The warning was given three times in Scripture. The first warning uh, concerning Scripture, not to add or subtract, was given back in Proverbs. In fact, it goes back even further than that to Deuteronomy and then you got Revelation. So three times the warning has gone out. Deuteronomy, Proverbs, Revelation. Just so you couldn't miss it. And if you mess with the scripture, the Lord will mess with you. And he would do that by, like I say, Revelation 22, taking your name out of the book of life. But here, Abraham has been privileged. He's been chosen to witness the Lord's visit to earth. If you think about chapter 6, if you think about Almighty God giving mankind 120 years to repent and Noah was told to build an ark and he did so and as he built his ark 
his friends and family would have watched him, they would have laughed at him, they would have mocked him, much like people do today to street preachers like myself. <laughs> Excuse the sniffing. And that ark was big enough for everybody to board it. But of course, the Lord knew through foreknowledge that, like many are called, few are chosen. And therefore, it was left to just eight souls to board the ark, along with the animals. And when the flood came, and it was a global flood, everybody, excluding uh, Noah and co, were wiped off the face of the earth. And you say to me, how about children? Yes. You say to me, how about old people? Yes. You say to me, how about sick people? Yes. You say, how about animals? Yes. Because the commission was given back in Genesis chapter 1 to have dominion over the earth, over the animal world, so on and so forth. And when man fell, he took the animal with him. He took the animal world with him. On top of that, you've got probably bestiality. And therefore the Lord said, you know what? I'll just start all over again which of course is his prerogative, and he wiped out everyone excluding Noah and co. Well, something similar is now about to take place concerning Sodom and Gomorrah. Look at verse 9 from chapter 18. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in a tent. Now, as this starts to unravel, you've got, like I say, Abraham, very privileged to speak to Jesus Christ, and more likely, or probably uh, realistically uh, joined by two angels. I don't go for the uh, Mormon belief. And now they want to know where Sarah, his wife, is, which goes back to chapter 2, chapter 3. Adam, where art thou? The Lord knew where Adam was. The Lord knew what had taken place, but he wanted to draw Adam out. He wanted Adam to repent. He wanted Adam to confess. And like I keep saying, and I will continue to, that you can take such a passage from uh, the third chapter of Genesis and apply it to anyone living today. Where are you, Mr. Sinner? Where are you, Miss Sinner or Mrs. Sinner? He knows, of course, where you are, but the point is he wants you to come clean. He wants you to present yourself to him. He wants you to say, I am here, Lord. I'm a sinner. And that is found over in Luke chapter 5 concerning Simon Peter. In fact, Simon Peter, along with Isaiah, would say, Depart me, Lord. I'm an unclean man. My lips are unclean. I'm not worthy to be in the presence of you. A great picture of humility. And I am convinced that when we, as saved people, arrive at the judgment seats of the Lord, we will just cower. We will just cover our eyes because we are in the presence of deity. In fact, like I say, I'm working my way through 2 Corinthians, and Paul says over in chapter 5 that it is the terror of the Lord. It's not something to take lightly. It says how you be judged uh, concerning the good and the bad that you've done in your body. Going back to your body being the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verse 10 please. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. And so I heard it in the tent door which was behind him. So like I said last time, the Lord does big things and he does small things. To build an ark, as far as uh, mankind was concerned, was somewhat of a joke. And yet it would take over 120 years to build and to then assemble many animals to go in. It wasn't something which would have been easy to have achieved. And here the Lord is going to pick an elderly couple in their 70s going into their 80s to bring forth a son like the parents of John the Baptist. And that's even to this day quite remarkable to think that a woman in her 70s going into her 80s could give birth. Of course, today that is impossible, even with IVF, even with uh, help from modern science is still very difficult, if not impossible. But here the Lord can do whatever he wants to do. And I like to remind Muslims that I speak to on the street that if the Lord wanted to have a son and he did, why couldn't he? Or I turn it around and I say this, you mean to tell me that you can have children like a son or a daughter or perhaps both, and yet the Lord who made the earth in six days and rested on the seventh day is unable to do the same thing? 
You mean to tell me that he can't have children if he wanted to? Not in the sense that mankind has children, you understand, but just let it be done, just decree it, just wave your finger, just say, let there be life, or make her pregnant and it's done. You mean to tell me that he can't do that? Of course he can. You mean to tell me that as a Muslim, you are more powerful than Almighty God? It's absurd. But of course, they haven't thought this thing through. They don't like the idea of God having a son. I'll tell you something, if you look at the Quran carefully, and yes, it's still my project, <laughs> probably when I finished uh, Cromwell, to go through the Quran and take some time out to write about the Quran and Islam. But it says back in the Quran, and I think parts of the Hadith, that the angels were told to bow down to Adam. Now, this is a problem for Islamic apologists because they don't like the idea of, for example, Allah, their God, having any partners. They believe that Allah is their God. They believe that their prophets were all sinless, which of course is impossible. Only Jesus Christ was sinless. And therefore, when you get to the account of Adam, when you get to the account of angels being told, down, uh, being told to bow down and worship Adam, who was only a man, it kind of clashes with their belief that Allah wouldn't share his glory with anyone else. If you read John chapter 17 sometime, Jesus Christ made it very clear that the Father and himself would share intimacy, they would share their glory. And yet, if you go to Isaiah, I think it's 44, 45 and 46, off the top of my head, it says how the Lord wouldn't share his glory with anyone. And therefore, Jesus Christ has to be Almighty God. And of course, we refer to such as God manifest in the flesh. So the Muslim has a problem when it comes to angels, which are higher than mankind, being commanded by Allah, meaning the God, to bow down to Adam. And yet, you are told very clearly in the scripture that only the Lord is worthy of worship. Look at verse 12, please. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, after I am wax old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also. She laughs at the promise that has been given. Now, it could be like her husband, she was somewhat nervous, and yet she'd be later challenged to come clean, to confess her doubts. If you think of the account from uh, Luke chapter 1, when the angel speaks to uh, Zacharias, and he says that he would give birth, or his wife would give birth, to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist would do a great work. He would turn the father's hearts, or the hearts of the fathers back to the Lord, being Jehovah, which, like I said last time, is a great verse for the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Zacharias starts to doubt as to what he is hearing. This priest, who should have known better, and of course he is struck with muteness. He can't speak because he doubted. He lacked the faith. And yet when Mary was told by Gabriel, incidentally not the angel of the Lord, uh, found in uh, Matthew chapter 1, which is probably the Holy Spirit. She doesn't doubt because she had greater faith. And it says over in the Gospels that you need to have faith like a child when it comes to the kingdom of God. And she was greatly blessed. She, just the record, isn't a uh, dispenser of grace. She is a recipient of grace. She can't help anyone. And yes, I know this year is the centurial, or the centurion, the uh, 100th anniversary, <laughs> shall I say, of the so-called appearance in Fatima, when the so-called Queen of Heaven appeared to some peasant children, and we just updated our article on Fatima. It's a great hoax, of course, and look at 2 Corinthians sometime. Like chapter 11, it speaks about people appearing as angels of light, it speaks about Satan having ministers, and if you think of Revelation 17 and Revelation 18, you find Satan has a church, being Mystery Babylon, being the Vatican, being Rome. I wouldn't have expected, I'll get back to this in a minute, I wouldn't have expected those children in Fatima back in 1917, peasant children like I say, to have known what they were experiencing. They were illiterate, 
and they saw this thing appear in the sky and I'm sure they saw something. We know about uh, the account from uh, Ezekiel of some kind of flying saucer appearing in the last days. So they saw something and they thought that what they saw was probably the Queen of Heaven. They had been raised on such a diet. They had been raised to believe that Mary was their mother, that Mary could help them out. Like uh, John Paul II, he was told when he was very young, when his mother died, that Mary was now his mother. And if you're told that at a young age, if your parent or parents or your community believe such a statement, why would you question it? Going back to the Mormon belief that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit would appear to Abraham from this piece of scripture. And yet, 1 Timothy chapter 6, like I say, makes it so very clear that no one is yet seen God the Father. But Sarah is old, verse 11, and well stricken in age, and has ceased uh, to be able to bear children after the manner of women. She's up in years. Life has passed her by, and I'm sure she would have prayed many a time to have been blessed to have children and yet she was never blessed to be a mother and somebody made the case some time ago that if you can't have children maybe adopt a child or maybe foster a child i think there may be some uh, legitimacy in making such uh, a statement such a claim there are many children that don't have parents that have been left in foster homes that have been passed around. Nobody wants them. And therefore, perhaps instead of spending lots of money going to clinics and having the IVF treatment, perhaps you might consider adopting a child. Also from verse 12, she calls Abraham, my Lord. What a great picture of humility. The ideal, uh, picture in scripture is for a couple to come together to get married of course no one lives together and for the woman to be in submission to her husband at the same time the husband has to treat his wife well he has to treat her like his own self which is what Paul speaks about in I think it's Ephesians chapter 4 or chapter 5 he says uh, over in Ephesians that no man has ever hated his body and he makes it very clear that People love their own bodies and are expected to love their own wives like Christ loved the church. So a man, especially if he's saved, should love his wife. A man, if he's saved, should cherish his wife. A man, if he's saved, should be a good father to his children. And if that is uh, the reality, if he does that, if he meets that criteria, then his wife is supposed to submit to him. It's very difficult, please excuse the sniffing, it's very difficult to say to a woman, for example, who is perhaps living with an unsaved man or is married to an unsaved man or is married to a saved man, but a cruel man, an indifferent man, uh, a backslidden man to do everything that she can for him when he is in violation of scripture himself. Of course, two wrongs don't make a right, you understand, but here, Sarah refers to Abraham as my Lord. And if you think of Abraham being a type of Christ, and if you think of Sarah being a type of the church, then you get some idea as to what is going on here. She is in subjection to her husband. We are in subjection to Christ. And I'll further come back and explain that further. Look at 13, please. And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Come clean, Sarah. Come clean, Abraham. There's no such thing in the scripture of infallibility or impeccability. The best of the best would lie. The best of the best would steal. The best of the best would lust. The best of the best would murder with their hearts. And of course, you know the account from 1 John chapter 5 that if you hate your brother, you are a murderer. And it goes on to say how nobody that hates their brother, being a murderer, has everlasting life. Somewhat of a frightening statement because I've observed many people over the years, many professing Christians over the years, that if looks could kill, would kill you. I remember one chap some years ago, 
a five-point Calvinist telling me that he hated his wife and he killed her in his heart every day of the week. And I thought, what a statement to make. He was a deacon in a church and I would have conversations with him. He had uh, an outreach, shall we say. He was pushing his church, should the truth be known, but he would go onto the streets regularly and I would speak to this, indivi this individual and you, know, you get to know people over a period of time and just to listen to him telling me how he hated his wife and he had four children and I thought wow he's a deacon in a church he's doing street work and yet all this hatred in his heart towards his wife who I was told is a Christian went to the same church as he did and about three years ago or maybe four years ago somebody told me that he divorced his wife and yet he scarred his wife, he had scarred his children's lives. 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Going back to my Islamic statement, you mean to tell me you can have children and yet the Lord cannot? Is anything, verse 14, too hard for the Lord? And Lord, in your King James Bible, will be uppercase, denoting Jehovah, denoting Elohim, denoting Adonai. And as a Trinitarian, we can take such a word and approach it or examine it, exegete it, knowing that the Father is three persons, but one God. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Absolutely not. At the time appointed, I will return unto thee, according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. It would have been impossible for this to take place. I'm sure they spent years trying to have children, and yet they were getting older. They were in their 80s around this time, and all around them, people would have said uh, such a couple uh, were never blessed to have children. She would have had to have lived with the stigma of being a woman up in years at the age of being a grandma had she had uh, grandchildren and yet children had evaded her. 15. Then Sarah denied saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. She's challenged. Verse 13. She lies, verse 15. Once again, there is no impeccability in Scripture. There is no infallibility in Scripture. John says that if we say that we haven't sinned, and he's speaking to say people, we make him, the Lord, a liar. Only Jesus Christ was sinless. At the same time, also be aware of this, that nobody, nobody in the Old Testament was born again. So we can't even look at such a piece of scripture and say, well, that's Sarah's old nature because she had no new nature to uh, counter her old nature. All of the Old Testament greats got saved, as you know, by believing on a promise. They got imputation. They got Christ's righteousness given to them. Perhaps Adam and Eve would have received such when the Lord gave them a covering from an animal, and perhaps that animal was a lamb. That's the best we can hope for when it comes to Adam and Eve's salvation. So the Old Testament greats going right into the Gospels, those that believed on a promise given by a person were saved. But they couldn't go to heaven because Christ hadn't come to die for their sins. And that's what Abraham's bosom is all about. Luke 16, 19 to 31. The righteous that died pre the arrival of the Messiah, waited in the ground. And you have the unrighteous also waiting in the ground for the great white throne judgment, Revelation chapter 20. They couldn't go to heaven. Now it is fair to say that Enoch and Elijah were probably the exception. But everyone else, like Moses, like Aaron, like Ezekiel, like Jeremiah, like <coughs> Isaiah, like Abraham and co, when they died, went into the ground, Abraham's bosom, <clears throat> and they waited for the Messiah to arrive. 
What we don't know is how much they understood about the uh, coming deliverer. We know that uh, Jesus made it very clear from the Gospel of John, chapter 8, I seem to recall, that when Abraham offered up Isaac, he rejoiced to see Christ's day. So I would suggest, and next time I'll look at chapter uh, 22, I think it is from Genesis, that when Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac, he got some kind of a glimpse, some kind of supernatural glimpse of God the Father sacrificing God the Son on Mount Calvary. And I seem to recall that where Abraham was preparing to sacrifice Isaac, Mount Moriah, I think it is for memory, would later be Mount Calvary. So you got a glimpse of some kind. But Sarah has been challenged, like Adam and Eve would be challenged, like Cain would be challenged to come clean. And all she had to do is say, forgive me, Lord, I was afraid, I was apprehensive, I was nervous, but she doesn't. She lies. It says 15 again. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, probably Christ, nay, but thou didst laugh. You did laugh, and you have lied to me. So take the time. Go through the scripture and examine the best of the best and you will see how they all fall short of the glory of the Lord. That's why Jesus would make it very clear that nobody is good but one, that being God. And you speak to Muslims and they say, well, all of uh, Allah's prophets were sinless and they believe that the greatest of their prophets was a man called Muhammad who may or may not have lived, but let's say that he did live for argument's sake. If you examine his lifestyle, you see very quickly how he had many wives, concubines, and the most infamous accounts of Muhammad's uh, sex life would concern a young child called Aisha. And I remember years ago speaking to some Islamic market stall holders about Aisha. I'll get back to this in a minute. And I remember saying to these uh, gentlemen, Muslims of course, how could it be? that your prophet would marry a six-year-old girl called Aisha and take her virginity when she was only nine. And one of the guys got very angry with me. And I don't think he'd either been aware of such an account because he seemed somewhat shocked by what I just said to him. And he spoke to an older uh, gentleman and he said, uh, is this true that our prophet, quote unquote, would do such a thing. And the older uh, Islamic gentleman knew all about it, of course. He said, well, that was how it was then, blah, blah, blah. And I really pressed the point home with these two. I said, listen, are you a father? And the guy said he was. This is the older Muslim. And I said, uh, how would you feel if somebody came to you and told you they were a prophet and said to you, by the way, the Lord, like Allah, meaning the God, which if you research is the moon god, going back to antiquity, has told me that I am to have your daughter as a wife. How would you feel about that? And he was very uncomfortable with my question and I carried on pressing him. And in the end, he said, uh, I wouldn't agree to it. And I thought, but your prophet would have approached the parents of Aisha, like Joseph Smith, would do to husbands of women that he wanted for his own. And Muhammad, like Smith, would take this young girl and other women down the line for his own. It's an inconsistency. And I think, if the truth be known, most Muslims have never been challenged to think about such a statement. They have been raised in Islamic circles like Catholics are raised in Catholic circles, like Mormons, like Jehovah's Witnesses are raised in such circles, and it's all they know. They don't really integrate, they don't really speak to people outside of their communities. So it was interesting to see, for me, these two men having to defend their prophet, so-called. But I'll tell you something, if you want to follow anyone, if you want to 
worship anyone, you want to find someone who is worthy of your time, just take a look at Jesus Christ. Just read the Gospels, check him out, see what he did, see how he lived. And any of you want to further research Muhammad, go for it, or the Hindu deities, or the Sikh deities, go for it. But I guarantee you something, they don't come anywhere near the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 20, please. And the Lord said, Behold, excuse me, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because a sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me, and if not, I will know. This is the mercy of the Lord. He knows everything, he sees everything, he can hear your prayers 24-7, never mind praying to Mary, she can't hear your prayers, and even if she could, she couldn't help you out, but when you pray to the Lord, wherever you live, at whatever time of the day, during any time of the week, he hears your prayers, and if it's his will, he will answer them straight away. And the Lord Jehovah said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, in the sense of wicked, not good, and because a sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which has come unto me, and if not, I will know. He knew what was going on, but here we are very much back in antiquity, like 4,000 years ago. In fact, make that about 5,000 years ago. And he wants to come down, he wants Abraham to know that he will deal with sin appropriately. And he wants Abraham to know that he is holy and that he hates sin. And yet at the same time, he is merciful. At the same time, he wants mankind to be saved. He would postpone judgments on the people of Noah's generation over a decade. He could have said to uh, Noah from uh, Genesis chapter 6 that tomorrow or next week or next month I will send a flood and it will destroy everyone and everything. But that's not what happened. He gave them over 120 years. Christ would say to the apostles and vicariously unbelieving Israel that they had 40 years to get their house in order. And of course they did not. And he allowed Titus and uh, one of his uh, trigger happy uh, soldiers to burn down the temple. So the Lord sits back many times. He waits. He doesn't go in all guns blazing. He waits for people to repent. He waited years for me to be saved. And here you've got something which is about to take place. But the Lord wants to go down and inspect it for himself. And if you think of Jesus Christ, uh, Paul says that he is our mediator. He is our go-between. And if you think of people like Muhammad or Mary Baker Eddy or the popes or anyone anywhere at any time who would offer themselves as something special. And yet, at best, those people could only relate to their fellow man. But Jesus Christ could relate to God and man. Jesus Christ knew what it was to be God and man. He could be on the earth and yet be in heaven at the same time. He, go, he, you know, he could go into the ground. It says how he would set captivity captive and yet still be seated up in heaven next to his father. That's why, again, if you want to worship anyone, he's the man to worship. He's the person to worship. He's God and he's man. He knows what it's like to be God and he knows what it's like to be man. And it says over in Hebrews how he's able to help anyone that comes unto him. 22. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. The Lord, L-O-R-D, uppercase. It's Jesus Christ. It's a Christophany or Theophany. Theo being Greek again for God. But I believe, based on other scriptures, I believe that Abraham is face to face with Jesus Christ, Christophany. I believe that when Moses would uh, see the Lord, the Lord would say to Moses that he would be able to see his back parts from behind. He says, uh, nobody could see me and live. So the Lord 
in the person of Jesus Christ, I believe, would appear here to Abraham, to Abraham, <coughs> and it also says uh, how the man turned their faces from thence. They're going to spit up, and if you get a chance, there's a there was a video made or there's a film made, I should say, back in the 1960s called The Bible, and in that film made by John Huston a very well-known American uh, director, unsaved unfortunately, Irish-American I believe, um, and probably a Catholic as well, being Irish-American. There's a scene in that film called The Bible where, I think it was Peter O'Toole, plays uh, the angel of the Lord, another notorious actor, but that's Hollywood for you. And I think it was George C. Scott who played Abraham, and O'Toole goes to see uh, George Scott, George C. Scott, let me just correct myself, and the dialogue is based on Genesis 18, and they arrive as three persons. It's a typical scene like uh, some of David Lean's movies, shot from a distance, very well directed I should say, and you've got these three characters walking towards Scott, and the one in the middle, uh, is the one whose eyes you see. You think of that term, you know, three and one, uh, one and three, the, uh, the one in the middle died for me. Let's try that again. Three and one, one and three, and the one in the middle died for me. And you see uh, Jesus and two angels walking towards George Scott, George C. Scott. It's an interesting scene and it's pretty accurate as well. Most films that I've watched, I'll get back to this quickly, uh, most Christian films that I've watched, most biblical films that I've watched, stray from scripture. Very few films that I've watched over the years would be worth sharing with anybody. And I've seen most of those biblical films, if not all of them. I think my favorite would be Ben-Hur, and yet most of Ben-Hur is based on uh, the Roman centurion, very uh, friendly with uh, Judah Ben-Hur, played by uh, Charlton Heston. Brilliant film, very well directed, and probably the last 20 minutes of the film are very emotional when Christ is on the cross, he's bleeding, and a guy called uh, Finney, a well-known actor, turns to uh, Charlton Heston, who uh, plays uh, Judah Ben-Hur, and he says he's dying for the sins of the world. That's one of the few films that I've ever watched where they explain why Christ died for the sins of the world. If you watch for example, The Greatest Story Ever Told, made by uh, George Stevens, 1960, 1961. The man who plays Jesus in that film is uh, the actor, uh, Max von Sydow, very good actor from Sweden, I seem to recall, and Max von Sydow plays Jesus. Looks like him as well, I would suggest, and yet that film, nearly three and a half hours long, never once mentions a new birth, never once mentions repentance, never once mentions why Jesus died for the sins of the world. If you were to watch that film back in 1960, I would suggest that you probably thought that Jesus was a good man, that he came to make this world a better place, that he came to help us out, but you wouldn't have come away from that uh, auditorium, that theatre, that cinema, having your sins exposed to you, I doubt you would have come away saying to yourself, I need to get born again, because the plan of salvation was never given in such a film. In fact, I remember when I watched uh, The Passion of the Christ back in 04, hadn't been saved very long, a very heavy film, a very uh, bloody film, and no, I don't recommend it, and I watched that film, and I have to say it was well shot, as far as the, uh, uh, as far as the uh, artistic uh, direction would go, Mel Gibson, a Catholic, I'm afraid to say, is a good director, incidentally. And yet that film, maybe two hours long, has Jesus, played by a Roman Catholic, um, speaking in uh, Hebrew and at times Aramaic, never once, never once gave the plan of salvation. And if you were to watch that film, and many people did, you would have been just torn to shreds to see this man whipped to death, uh, blood everywhere. I mean, it's the most graphic film you ever watch concerning what Jesus went through for our 
wicked grubby sins and yet Gibson failed. He failed to articulate the plan of salvation. He failed to explain why Jesus went through that. So be mindful <coughs> if you want to watch a Christian film or even a secular film about Jesus Christ because many times these directors, all unsaved as well of course, will put stuff into the film or their films which isn't correct and they call that subliminal uh, scenery and you watch such a film and it stays in your mind and you think that what you've seen is correct and many times it is not. And the men 22 turn their faces from thence. Two angels, like I say, like an advanced party. And went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Abraham was able to come into close fellowship with the Lord. Pre your salvation, you aren't saved. You are an enemy of God. You have no hope in this world. And if you were to die, pre your salvation, you, you know, you go straight to hell. You can't go to heaven because you are a sinner. You can't go to heaven because heaven is a place for the redeemed. Heaven is a place for those that have been cleansed. Heaven is a place for those that worship the Lord. That doesn't mean you can't go to heaven. Of course you can go to heaven, but you've got to receive what's been done for you. You've got to receive it through humility. You've got to receive it through repentance. You've got to receive it through faith. And that's something which is so overlooked. 23. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Sometimes yes. Sometimes the righteous, sometimes the good, will suffer with the unrighteous, the not so good people. Sometimes the good will suffer with the bad. If you think of uh, Lazarus, and the beggar, you've got this beggar outside a rich man's house and the rich man is dressed in purple and it says how he fed sumptuously every day and you could suggest that was a picture of a cardinal perhaps, he likes to dress in purple, he likes to dress up in fancy uh, costume, but stick with the text, it's probably aimed at a Jew, a well-to-do Jew and in the eyes of society that uh, well-to-do Jew was probably highly thought of would have gone to the temple regularly, would have gone to a synagogue regularly, and yet outside his mansion was a beggar, very much overlooked by society, and people would have said, uh, that man is cursed, that man is a failure, that man has done nothing with his life, so on and so forth. And they both die, Luke 16, 19 to 31, around the same time. And to the shock of the rich man, it says how he was just thrown into hell. And yet, when the beggar died, it says he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Sort of uh, mirroring Christ's ascension into heaven and uh, sort of mirroring our rapture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It's like we get some kind of an angelic uh, uh, assistance. We get some kind of an angelic uh, escort shall I say, when we die. And yet for the unrighteous, the lost, they are simply discarded. But Abraham drew near and he says, wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? In Abraham's mind, he's thinking of Lot, referred to as his nephew, referred to as his brother. And he's thinking that Lot's a good man. And Peter mentions Lot as being a righteous man. It's hard to believe, but he was a saved man, but he was carnal. He was in the flesh. Now, for the New Testament, we would look at someone like Lot and suggest that he was feeding his old nature. But again, nobody in the Old Testament was born again. Those in the Old Testament, if they were saved, were saved by receiving imputation. It's going to be grace, again, from uh, creation to Calvary, Calvary to the rapture, the rapture to the end of the tribulation and the beginning of the millennium into eternity. Yes, the tree of life reappears, Genesis chapter 2, excuse me, uh, Revelation chapter 2, mirroring Genesis chapter 2, and that tree of life reappears at the end of Revelation uh, 21, 22. But it's still going to be grace. The Lord will 
make it clear to those in the millennium going into eternity that they will need to take of the tree of life for the healing of the nations. So he will dispense grace, it would appear, via a tree. Going back to Genesis chapter 2, chapter 3. But uh, Abraham is thinking about Lot and he is mediating between Lot and the Lord. He's the middle man picturing Jesus Christ, of course. Look at 24. Peradventure there be fifty righteous within a city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? If only there had been fifty people in Sodom and Gomorrah. And I guess it's probably fair to say that one of the reasons why Britain hasn't been destroyed, or Canada, or America, or New Zealand, or Australia, is because you've got people that are saved, living in such countries and praying for their leaders in such countries and trying to win souls to the Lord from such countries. But he's hoping that perhaps there may be 50 within the city. He knows, of course, that at most it's going to be two or three. He's thinking that perhaps Lot and his wife and their children and his son-in-laws are decent enough to get out before the judgment comes. And this conversation continues into verse 25. That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Absolutely. In his mind, and it's fair to say this, that in the mind of Abraham, he knows that the Lord doesn't doesn't just wipe everyone out for the fun of it. He wants people to be redeemed. Abraham, by this time in his life, was a saved man. And I made the case last time, if you think of uh, chapter 12 of Genesis, it starts with Abraham being convicted. Uh, chapter 15 of Genesis, it pictures Abraham being justified. Chapter 17 of Genesis, it pictures him being circumcised. Turn the circumcision into a baptism. Turn uh, justification into your justification from 15. And take chapter 12 as account of conviction concerning your conviction. And you get a picture, don't you, of an Old Testament saint being saved in a similar way to how we get saved in the New Testament. The difference being that when Abraham believed on the Lord, uh, chapter 12, chapter 15, chapter 17, there was no blood atonement mentioned. There was no substitutionary atonement mentioned. There was no God-man mentioned. He simply believed the promise given by the Lord. Fast forward to the New Testament, the promise given by the Lord in the Old Testament is our person, our man, the man Christ Jesus. So Christ Jesus gave the promise in the Old Testament. They believed on that. And for those of us living today, we are saved by believing on a person. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Absolutely. This is his world. He controls everything. He is the landlord of the entire solar system and beyond. He can do whatever he wants to do. And if you think of a government, they are very powerful. They can decide who comes into their country. They can refuse people entry into their country. They can turn people around or send them back to their country of origin and say that you're not welcome here. They have the right to do that. You go for a job interview. The person interviewing you has the right to either employ you or not employ you. In fact, if you want to get on a bus in the morning, the driver has the right to refuse you. A train driver, or a train guard to be more precise, has the right to refuse you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Yes, he will. And I think Abraham is trying to buy some time. He knows about the flood, from the sixth chapter. He knows about the fall from the third chapter. He knows that the Lord is holy. He knows that the Lord is also merciful. To go beyond that, like everlasting hell, is going to be problematic because around this time, the Bible hasn't been written. Around this time, they are receiving the patriarchs, being Abraham and a few others, like perhaps Melchizedek, but especially Abraham, progressive revelation. The Lord 
would spend 1,000 years, 2,000 years, 3,000 years revealing different things to different people. No one man, no one woman would get all of the glory. Going to the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ had 12 men and the 70, and he would spend time with those men, uh, briefing them, prepping them, preparing them for service. And when he died, uh, or before he died, around the time of his death, Judas Iscariot would betray him, would kill himself by suicide. And now you've got just 11 men. The apostles have a meeting, Acts chapter 1, and they replace Judas with Matthias. And you would have thought that now they are 12 again, and with the 70, that those men could have done what the Apostle Paul would do. And the Lord said, no, I want someone else. I want to choose someone else. And he would choose the Apostle Paul, Acts chapter 9. And what Paul was called to do, I would suggest that all of the others, including Simon Peter, could never have done. And he's revealing truths to Paul. He is revealing truths to Peter and probably John and others. And that's why, again, like I said last time, the early church were a community because the apostles were receiving ongoing revelations. The first book in the New Testament to be written was either Matthew or James. Some have suggested perhaps 1 Corinthians. We can't be dogmatic about which book was written first, but here Abraham, like Job before him, is walking by faith, is receiving ongoing revelations. And here he's trying to buy time. 26, and the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within a city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Once again, he wants to be reconciled to mankind. It says in 2 Corinthians how God was in Christ reconciling the world, and I mean the world, unto himself. Peter would say that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It says how he tasted death for every man. It speaks about him weeping over Jerusalem. It speaks about Christ being a man acquainted uh, with sorrows and grief. He was a very emotional man. I think only once, only once in the four Gospels does it say Jesus rejoiced. Just once. And from memory, I may be wrong when I say this, but from memory, that term, Jesus rejoiced in spirit, was concerning God the Father revealing truths to Jesus' uh, to the Lord's intimate circle and keeping back sacred truths uh, to the multitude or from the multitude, going back to don't cast your pearls before swine. And Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit, thanking the Father for revealing truths to the babes. I think that's from uh, Matthew 11, from memory. That's the only time that Jesus ever rejoiced. Every other time it says he was grieved, he was tired, he sat down, he was angry, he felt this, he felt that. He was a very emotional man, very human. And that's, again, something for us to rejoice in, that our Saviour could relate to us, could understand what we go through, wasn't aloof, wasn't indifferent. And yet look at anyone else, that you care to think of. They can't relate to what it's like to be God at the same time as being a man. 27, and Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I've taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. I am nothing, Lord. I am filthy in your sight, Lord. If I got what I deserved, I would be destroyed. In fact, the statement was made some years ago. Why doesn't the Lord just deal with all of the wickedness on the face of the earth. Why doesn't he just destroy everyone that is wicked? Well, if he did, you and I would be wiped out, right? Even after you're saved, you're still wicked. Even after you're saved, the old man or the old woman in you is pulling you, pushing you, uh, tugging at you to feed the flesh. If you don't believe me, just spend a few moments speaking to those that are close to you and ask them to assess you. Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I've taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, 
which am but dust and ashes. Peradventure there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. Now, Abraham knows the Lord is merciful, and yet at the same time, he doesn't want to overstep the mark. He doesn't want to cause the Lord to lose his temper. And this conversation goes on for several more verses. And I think of uh, such accounts, and I think about some of the uh, stories in the New Testament, the Gospels, how the Lord is so patient. And here, Abraham, a saved man, saved by faith like you and I, is mediating for the New Testament. It's a picture of us interceding for someone that we know could be saved, could be unsaved. And in his mind, he's thinking that if I keep on like this, the Lord is going to be angry with me. Well, not really. The Lord is like a, uh, like a father, like a parent. And if you are a good parent, you don't slap your children down every time they do wrong. If you are a good parent, you allow your children to learn by their mistakes. If you are a good uh, parent, you don't uh, get the belt out the moment your child does wrong. And yes, if your child does do wrong in a perpetual sense and doesn't uh, show any kind of remorse, then perhaps you will get the belt out. Latter part of 28, and he said, if I find there 40 and 5, I will not destroy it. If only there had been 45 there. If only there had been 45 back in the day of Noah. It would result in just eight souls being saved. Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2, you've got over 120 souls in the upper room. 1 Corinthians 15, Christ would appear to above. 500 brethren at the same time. Many are called, few are chosen. The road to hell is wide. And many of the be which go in there at that entrance into hell, which is never full, according to Isaiah. And yet the entrance, the gate, the path to life is narrow and few, and I mean few there be that find the way, that find the gate. Many want to be saved, but few will find the way. Few will find their way into everlasting life because people want to approach the Lord or a God of their, cho uh, a God of their choice a god of their, cho uh, of their choosing, excuse me, they want to approach their deity their own way. Like a Catholic wants to approach the Lord via their church. They can't comprehend any other way of approaching heaven outside of their church. The Mormons are not, are, aren't much better. The Mormons are convinced that outside of the LDS setup, you can't make it. The JWs believe that outside of the Kingdom Hall, there's no truth. And therefore, if you live and die outside of the Kingdom Hall, you are finished. There's no way for you to be redeemed. And yet Jesus would say that he was the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you read Acts of the Apostles very carefully, it says, on many occasions, how the Apostles preached Jesus. 2 Corinthians says how Paul preached Jesus. Paul would tell you that he didn't preach himself, he preached Jesus. Do you give out tracts? What do your tracts say? Do your tracts preach Jesus? Do your tracts promote Jesus? Or do your tracts promote your church? Do your tracts promote your minister? Do your tracts promote your ministry? That's the quickest way to know whether or not you are doing the Lord a service or simply promoting yourself. 32, and he said, O let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once, peradventure, ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. Ten people, ten people, if, could, you know, if ten people could be found, if uh, 45 people could be, uh, could be found, if 50 people could be found, I will spare the entire city. 50 people, I'll spare it. 45 people, I will spare it. 10 people, I will spare it. Now we believe that the size of Solomon and Gomorrah, or the amount of people that lived in Solomon and Gomorrah, was around 10 million, 10 million souls. And he says, if just 10 people can be found in a town, 
consisting or cities consisting of 10 million, I will spare such a place. That's such a picture of mercy. That's such a picture of grace. That's such a picture of love. Just 10 righteous people, just 45 righteous people, just 50 righteous people, and I will overlook the sins of 10 million people. And yet people still kick against it, they still reject it, they still make fun of such an account because they love their sins more than the Lord. It says over in John chapter 3 how men loved darkness rather than light. Why? Because their sins were evil. They won't come to the light in order to be, to be reproved. So I appreciate what Abraham was doing here from 18. I appreciate his mediation. I appreciate him trying to get between heaven and earth, if you will, via the Lord. But for the New Testament, now here's the good news. For the New Testament, post-Calvary, we don't need to go through anyone. We can go straight to the Lord through Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is Almighty God. We don't have to go through a church system. We don't have to go through a ministry or a minister. Yes, it's true, ministers and ministries will, will help you, will uh, explain scriptures to you, and yes, it's true, such people may give you a tract on a street corner and speak to you and pray with you and perhaps help you to be saved, and yet even that isn't really necessary. You just believe in the Lord to be saved. But they, they may help you, they may assist you in your growth as a new Christian, but when it comes to a relationship with Almighty God, it's between you and the Lord. I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And of course the account continues, which we now pick up from chapter 19, verse 1. And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot seeing them rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold, now my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet. And you shall rise up early, and go in your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. So here, Lot is polite. He's also carnal. But like I say, he doesn't have the new nature. He doesn't have Christ's seed abiding in him, which is spoken of from 1 John. He was saved, like Abraham, like Isaac, like everyone in the Old Testament, but he's not born again. So he's carnal, but he's saved, and he's polite, and he wants these two angels, no doubt mentioned from the previous chapter, to dine with him. It says how Lot was sitting in the gate. He is a very powerful man, I guess, you might suggest he would be the equivalent to a mayor in your local town. And he wants, the, uh, he wants these angels, he calls them lords, in verse 2, to turn in and wash their feet, be fed, and rise up early the following day. I don't think he knew they were angels. I think he saw two men, well-dressed, that were appearing to him en route to do a work. And... It does show you that you can be saved, you can be carnal, and also polite at the same time. Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. He must have thought to himself, whatever for? Why would you want to live on a street corner? Or why would you want to sleep on a street corner? Or why would you want to be on a street or in the street all night long? Three, and he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him and entered into his house. And he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. Angels can eat, angels can speak, angels can touch. But here, this is very reminiscent of, I think it's Luke uh, 24, when uh, Cleopas and Co. on the road to Emmaus come into contact with the risen Christ, and they wanted him to dine with them, and he did so. And here, Lot has pressed upon them greatly, verse 3, and they turn in and enter into his house, and he makes them a feast, and they sit down to eat. So angels can eat, angels can speak, angels can communicate, and angels also appear like men. 
not women. Look at verse 4, please. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compass a house round about. Compass a house round, excuse me, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. So before the night is out, before they lay down, they're now going to attempt to sleep, which shows that angels can sleep. The men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, surrounded the house, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. So word has got out that these two angels have arrived, and I would suggest they are appearing as young men, perhaps good-looking men, and these men from Sodom and Gomorrah have come to the house of Lot. Five again, and they call unto Lot, and said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. They want to have intercourse, they want to have sex with these angels, referred to today as gay sex. They are desperate to meet these men. They are burning from within. And Paul picked us up over in Romans chapter 1, how men lust after men, women lust after women. Verse 8, Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them even, excuse me, and do ye to them as it is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. I've got two daughters. What a statement to make. Which have not known man, virgins, let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. What a statement to make. Only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. We would call Lot a man pleaser. Paul says over in Galatians that he didn't come to please man. He's not a man pleaser. In fact, Jesus would say from John chapter 2 that he knew what was in man and didn't need man to testify unto him. He knows that man is no good. And here Lot, on the one hand, is a righteous man and yet he's a corrupted man. He doesn't want his visitors to be uh, molested. He is happy for his daughters to be molested. He is being corrupted by his society. And I would suggest he was sucking up to his VIPs. 10. But the man put forth a hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut to the door. That's a great picture of the Lord reaching out to a saved man or saved woman and stopping him or her going further into sin. I don't know how many times the Lord has stopped me going further into sin, and maybe the same is true of you. But here they know that he can't reason with such people. They have gone past the point of no return. And if they don't bring him in, if they don't rescue him, they will probably uh, lynch Lot. 11. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness both small and great, so that they weird themselves to find the door. They're now blind, and they are trying to find the door handle. And you would have thought, after being struck with blindness, a terrifying thought, that they would regroup, they would uh, run away. But no, they are continuing, as blind people, to find the door handle. They are desperate for lots visitors. They want to molest them. They want to rape them. You can't really comprehend it, can you? It could be that you've got a mob of around a hundred people, maybe more, outside the house of Lot. At the same time, Lot has lost his testimony. And I'm slightly jumping ahead of myself. Look at verse 16. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. While he lingered, while Lot lingered, 
picturing a saved man very much in love with the world. A saved woman very much in love with the world. And yet the scripture says, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. You become cold. You become lukewarm. And the revelation says that Jesus will spew out of his mouth. He will spew you. He will vomit you out of his mouth. A very uh, unpleasant scripture, I know. But to spew you, to vomit you, is a picture of rejecting you. And while he lingered, the men, the angels, laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city, outside of the city. You get saved, and you reach out to the Lord in a spiritual sense, and he grabs your hand, and he keeps you saved. We call that eternal security. Elsewhere it says that the Father has you in his hand. We call that double security. You are now safe in the Beloved. But here there seems to be some kind of a delay. Lot isn't yet ready to turn his back on the world. So the angels have to take the initiative. They have to grab the hand <coughs> of Lot, his wife and his daughters. And they are doing so because the Lord, uppercase, is merciful unto him and precariously his family, and they bring him forth and set him outside of the city. So, in some ways, that's a picture of the rapture, a picture of you and I being removed from planet Earth uh, with the anticipation of the tribulation to commence afterward. I'll come back and discuss that in a few minutes. 18, and Lot said unto them, O oh, not so, my Lord, Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast shown unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. Behold, now this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. O oh, let me escape thither, is it not a little one, and my soul shall live. Not so, Lord. Lord, you got it wrong. And in my Bible, Lord is capital L. You've got a picture here of Lot, a saved man, arguing with the Lord. Christophany, Jesus Christ. Go to uh, Acts chapter 10. Peter is arguing with the Lord. Saved man, born again man, two natures. And Lot said unto him, O oh, not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight. Going back to Moses, finding grace in the sight of the Lord. Going back to Noah, finding grace in the sight of the Lord. And yes, in the context concerning the soon-to-be destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. But spiritually speaking, concerning Lot's salvation. And thou hast magnified thy mercy, absolutely. Which thou hast shown unto me and saved my life in a physical sense, and also in a spiritual sense, like everlasting life. And I cannot now, and I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. A lack of faith as well. Behold, now this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither, let me go there. Is it not a little one? In a rhetorical question, in a rhetorical sense, I should say, and my soul shall live. He's almost bartering with the angel. He wants to flee to a spot of his own choosing. Time is of the essence. The Lord is about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, pictured over in uh, the book of Revelation. Lot has been removed before such an event takes place, which I would suggest is a picture of our rapture. 22. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou come thither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zor. We can't destroy the city, Mr. Lot, until we get you out of the city. You are redeemed, you are greatly beloved. Therefore we can't destroy the earth, if you will, until the rapture of the church has taken place. 27. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the plain and toward all the land of the plain, and beheld. 
and though the smoke of the country went up as a smoke of a furnace. There's a vision of hell. And here Abraham gets up early in the morning, 27, where he stood before the Lord, and he's looking towards Sodom and Gomorrah. And he can see the smoke of the country going up like a smoke of a furnace, which is suggested to be the case from Luke 16. Again, the rich man in hell speaking to the uh, uh, speaking to Abraham, and Abraham says to the rich man in hell, "You can't come to us. We can't come to you." There's also accounts from uh, Isaiah and Ezekiel of conversations taking place, and there's also an account. I think it's in Isaiah, where those on the earth and during the millennium are going to see what is going on in hell. I don't know if that's the case. <coughs> I've heard it said before <coughs> by certain people that that's what will take place. I don't know how that will work in reality, but I guess if it was possible or if the Lord wants it to happen, it will happen. But here, Abraham is watching from a distance. He sees what is taking place and he's hoping that Lot has got out, and his wife and daughters. He doesn't yet know, of course, which is a bit like those of us when we die. We hope that uh, friends and family got saved, uh, but we don't know. We hope that our uh, circle of friends got saved, but we don't know. And when we arrive in eternity, then we know who was saved and who wasn't saved. 30. A Lot went up out of Zor, and dwelt in the mountain, and his two daughters with him, for he feared to dwell in Zor. And he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. This account gets cited by many people, many enemies of the Bible, and we call such people Biblophobes. And such Biblophobes like to make fun of what I'm about to read shortly, and they say that Lot was uh, some kind of a pervert. But of course, that fails to A, uh, do justice to the text, B, to understand the background to the text, and C, to misunderstand what it was like back in the day, going back to Noah and family, going back to Adam and Eve being told to repopulate the earth. 31. And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that he may, that we may preserve seed of our father. So, they think, they believe that the entire world has been wiped out, which was incorrect, only Sodom and Gomorrah, and they are of the opinion that what Adam and Eve were told to do, like I say, uh, fill the earth, replenish the earth, what the sons of Noah were told to replenish the earth is now going to fall to them. So, on the one hand, I am sympathetic to what is going through their minds, but at the same time, they have been corrupted. And that's why you have to separate from unsaved people, because they will contaminate you. That's all there is to it. And here you've got two daughters engaged to men, They've got out of Sodom and Gomorrah. The mother looks back, becomes a pillar of salt. Also, I should have say that Lot tried to witness, quote unquote, to his family, and it says how they thought he was uh, mocking them, or they thought he was joking with them. You say, why? Well, he lost his testimony. There's a picture of a saved man who is carnal, <coughs> and when he speaks to his own family, and his friends, they don't take him seriously because he's been living in the world. And how many times have you tried to witness for the Lord after living in the world for too long? The world laugh at you. Let us make our father drink wine and we will lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. So, if he was some kind of a pervert, if he got some kind of a kick, out of this soon-to-be incest incident, why would his daughters need to make him drunk? Why would his daughters have to intoxicate their father? Because they knew that although he was carnal, although he lost his testimony, he wasn't that carnal. He wasn't that wicked. He wouldn't have volunteered 
to do what is about to take place. They have to get him drunk in order to lie with him. Because one more time, in their minds, they thought everybody had been wiped off the face of the earth and it would fall to them to repopulate the earth. They were wrong, of course, but you understand the background to this text. 35. And they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger rose and lay with him, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. He wasn't even aware of what was taking place. Had he known what was taking place, I suggest to you that he would have stopped it. Which is a good picture uh, concerning the fact that no matter how far you drift away from the Lord, if you are the Lord's, there's always that uh, sense of you knowing within yourself that you can pull back. In other words, no matter how far you drift from the Lord, there's always an area that you'll never cross. There are things that you will never do. 36. Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. So I will say this, that what has taken place was wrong. It's incest. It's outlawed in scripture. And if you were found guilty of incest, you were put to death. It was wrong. It was wicked. The daughters have been corrupted by society thanks to their weak father. And yet at the same time, I think we can exonerate Lot from what has taken place. His first daughter gets him drunk, lies with him. The second daughter gets him drunk, lies with him. And the text says one more time, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. Had there been any kind of complicity here? Had there been any hint that this was agreed upon, that some kind of orgy was taking place, that something was materializing, that three people were in agreement, with such a wicked act, you would have been told. But he isn't aware of such an event because although he was carnal, like I say, he wasn't that carnal. Although he was a saved man living in the flesh, he wasn't living totally in the flesh. And even his daughters who were carnal and perhaps saved knew that their father wouldn't go beyond and do such a wicked act. 20 verse 1. And Abraham journeyed from thence to the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur. And sojourning Gerar, the man's on the move. And Abraham said of Sarah's wife, she is my sister. And Abelek, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. So you got, you got uh, Abraham and Sarah up in years. The promise has been given about Isaac. And... Like most people, they were traveling around. And he says to uh, this uh, Gentile leader how Sarah is his sister. Now, it's a half lie, going back to Sarah lying when the Lord would challenge her. Yes, Sarah was his sister, half-sister, but she was also his wife. And here Abraham, lacking faith in the Lord, when challenged by this Gentile leader, lies to him. 3. <clears throat> and God came to Abelech in a dream by night, and said unto him, or said to him, excuse me, Behold, thou art but a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. So, Abraham, type of Christ, a prophet. Sarah, a type of the church, the bride of the Lamb, greatly beloved, if you defile your temple, or if somebody defiles your temple, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you are judged and possibly put to death. That's why the Corinthians, over in chapter 11, were sleeping in Jesus. It wasn't to do with the Mass, which is what the Catholics would have you believe. It was to do with the fact that they were defiling their bodies. Corinthians 3, Corinthians 6, Corinthians 10 and Corinthians 11. Behold, thou art but a dead man. You're going to be a dead man if you mess with this man and his wife. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. 
the uh, man Isaac, like I say, will come from uh, Sarah, and Isaac is a type of Christ, and what the Lord doesn't want is some unclean Gentile to interfere with this Jewish woman, because like I say, she is going to be the mother of many nations. From her will come Isaac, and eventually the Messiah. Hence why the Lord makes it clear to this man in a dream by night that he is a dead man if he takes this woman for his own. But Amalek had not come near her. And he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Going back to Abraham, asking a question to the Lord. Said he not unto me, she is my sister. And she, even she herself, said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. That's somewhat of a stretch. Jeremiah says, your heart is desperately wicked. There's not a just man on the face of the earth, and yet there is some uh, truth to what he's saying to the Lord, although he's slightly milking it. Six, and God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee, therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. So he says, Yes, you are a good man, quote unquote, and yes through the integrity of your heart, verse 6, and yet on top of that, I also held thee from sinning against me. Did you get that? I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Not against uh, Sarah, but against the Lord. Demonstrating that she belongs to the Lord. She's a type of the church. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. I didn't allow you to touch her. It's a great picture on the one hand of self-control, five and six, and on top of that, the Lord restraining you from going over a cliff in a spiritual sense. We don't quite understand how the sovereignty of the Lord and the free will of man work, but they do. And here you've got a, you've got a Gentile leader, an unsaved man, a decent sort of guy who doesn't take it upon himself to get too close to this woman and at the same time the Lord is withholding him from sinning against him. Seven. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet. He shall pray for thee and thou shalt live. And if thou restore not, know that thou, know that thou shalt surely die. Thou and all that are thine. You mess with that woman, I'll kill you. You mess with that man, I'll kill you. That's the sort of language that is taking place here. And this is the Lord speaking, by the way. Which goes back to, if you mess with a saved man, if you mess with a saved woman, if you continue to interfere with a saved man, if you continue to interfere with a saved woman, the Lord will deal with you as he sees fit. Now therefore restore the man his wife, picture of the church, for he is a prophet, picture of Jesus. And he shall pray for thee, mediation, mediator, interceding, and thou shalt live in a physical sense. And if thou restore not, know thou that thou shalt surely die. Going back to Adam and Eve, taken of the uh, fruit from the tree, thou and all that are thine, picturing Pharaoh and co. He's saying that Sarah is holy, not sinless. He's saying that Abraham is holy, not sinless. He's saying that I've chosen this couple to eventually bring forth the Messiah. This couple are going to be the parents of the state of Israel. They are chosen vessels, and I don't want your grubby hands to mess around, to interfere with my plans. And it's probably fair to say that the devil was also somewhere in the mix probably trying to get this Gentile leader to interfere with uh, Sarah. Look at 12. And yet, indeed, she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. Eventually, Abraham confesses to his relationship with Sarah. Now, maybe it wasn't uh, this 
leader's business in the first place, and yet when they arrived in his kingdom, when they arrived in his town, it was the custom to <coughs> present a beautiful woman to the leader of such a place, and Abraham was obviously asked about this beautiful woman, and he says, she's my sister, and he stops there. He doesn't come clean, and it almost results in Sarah being taken by uh, Avalek, verse uh, 2, 3, and beyond for his own wife. And the Lord steps in, like I say, stops him from acting on his uh, desires for her. At the same time, this Gentile character, this Gentile man, is of the opinion that he's pretty decent, and again, through the integrity of his heart, and innocency of his hands, he hasn't done this. And the Lord says, yes, that's partly the case, but on top of that, I was also working in the background, you weren't aware of it, and I was stopping you from defiling Sarah, going back to the church, going back to the promise made from uh, Matthew 16, how the gates of hell will never overcome the church. The church will go through apostasy, the church will go through many different stages of... Uh, trials and tribulations, shall we say, but the church will never completely be wiped out. The church will never completely be uh, destroyed, contaminated. The church will shrink, and I say, when I say the church, I mean the body of Christ. It will shrink, it will go through all sorts of situations, but it will never uh, completely capitulate, because the gates of hell will never overly prevail or totally destroy the church. 17. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Amalek and his wife and his maid and his maidservants, and they bare children. Mediator again. 18. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Amalek because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So this would have gone on for a period of time. Abraham and Sarah would have spent some time in this man's kingdom, and during this situation the Lord has closed up all the wombs of all those of this man's household demonstrating that Sarah's calling was far superior to theirs like Mary's demonstrating that Mary would give birth to a very special child and she did demonstrating that nobody could mess around with Mary and they did not uh, demonstrating that nobody could mess around with Sarah because she is about to give birth to Isaac 21, 8. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. He's finally arrived. Isaac means laughter, incidentally. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham, mocking. Hagar being an Egyptian, Hagan being, so we are told, a descendant of Muhammad. You've got this unholy union no doubt, initiated by the devil. Abraham, like Adam, Abraham, like most men, was weak. And Abraham was told to wait. But he goes in unto Hagar, and she gives him uh, Ishmael, like I say. And now Sarah has seen the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which he had born unto Abraham, mocking. Isaac is the chosen seed. Isaac is beloved by his parents, but so was Ishmael for uh, Abraham, which shows one of the problems of a man having two wives. And I made the case some videos ago of that guy in America, a Mormon guy, who's got four, five, five women, five women, 18 children, and those children are having to share their father with their fellow siblings. The women are having to share their husband with one another. And every night he goes in to a different woman and lies with her. And they go along with that. They think that it is the will of the Lord. It's an abomination. And like I said last time or some videos ago, they are guilty of adultery. Their children are going to, going to uh, suffer the results of adultery. And my advice again uh, to those women, if they are watching this video, is to get out of such an unholy union. 10. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and a son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be with 
shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. Kick her out, Abraham, I don't like her. Abraham, we are Jews. She is a Gentile, she is an Egyptian. And if you take the Islamic accounts of this, and yes, with a pinch of salt, of course, you could suggest that she, Hagar, is a Muslim and Sarah is a Jew. You've got the Jews and the Muslims very much at enmity with each other. And it goes right back to Abraham's weakness and Abraham's inability to wait on the Lord. And this thing goes on, 11, and a thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. So he's reaping what he's sown. He was told to wait and he didn't. He got Hagar pregnant. She gave birth to Ishmael, which the Lord loved and took care of. And yet, had he waited, had he waited for Isaac, all this pain could have been avoided. The issue of Israel and the Arab states could have been avoided, but of course the devil was very much behind such, trying to thwart the eventual arrival of the Messiah. 14, and Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child, and sent her away and she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Bethsheba. He loved Ishmael, of course, like every parent loves their child. And he was also uh, mindful that he was responsible for the birth of this child and therefore he takes the time to give Hagar a bottle of water but he has to get rid of her. Cast out the bondwoman, which Paul uh, picks up in uh, Galatians. Cast out the bondwoman, the covenant has been made with Isaac, not Ishmael. 17. And God heard the voice of the lad. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aideth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Angel of the Lord, angel of God, could be a Christophany. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him in thine hand, for I'll make him a great nation. I will make him a great nation, and he did. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. Reminiscence of uh, John chapter 4. Jesus with the woman at the well. 20. And God was with the lad, and he grew, and dwelt in the wilderness, and became an archer. So you've got the Lord show mercy to somebody like Ishmael, who wasn't technically part of the Abrahamic covenant and yet was a descendant of Abraham. He's beloved, but he's not part of the Abrahamic covenant. He's not going to be part of the Mosaic covenant. Therefore, was he saved? Probably not. But he was beloved. The Lord took care of him in a physical sense, which feeds into Matthew chapter 5, how the Lord allows a son to come up and go down how the Lord feeds people, whether they are saved or not, how the Lord allows people to enjoy life, whether they are saved or not. So I think I will close it there and just give a quick and very uh, brief recap. That's what we've looked at over the last 90 minutes, I guess, or thereabouts, and say that the Lord is merciful, the Lord is good, of course, the Lord wants people to be saved. He was prepared to overlook the sins of 10 million people for the sake of 10 righteous people, but he couldn't find 10. He couldn't even find five. He found three, being Lot and his two daughters. The daughters were corrupted. The daughters were, in some ways, a victim of their surroundings. They had a weak father. Also, Lot's wife wasn't uh, the same race as he was. His wife was a local. I think she was a Syrian from memory, so he had married unequally, or he had an unequal union. He had married an unsaved woman, shall we say, which is condemned in both testaments, and he had children with his unsaved wife, can we say. It was a union which 
should never have taken place. And yet the daughters thought they were doing the right thing. Lot thought that he was doing the right thing. And he gets out of Sodom and Gomorrah. They get him drunk. And of course they produce seed through their father. And that will feed into all sorts of problems down the line, which I'll look at later on. Uh, you've also got Abraham lying. You've got Sarah lying. You've got both refusing to come clean. And yet the Lord still works with such people. Praise the Lord because we can also be guilty of doing such things. Abraham is mediating before this, hoping to buy time, but uh, the Lord has made up his mind to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and that's just what happens. Uh, 20 and 21, you've got Abraham re uh, reaping what he has sown, you've got Abraham paying the consequences of his sins, and you've got the Lord appearing to a man through dreams, warning him not to mess with Sarah, not to mess with Abraham, because both are holy, both are chosen vessels, and are types of Christ, and are types of the church. So you've had quite a bit of material. So let's close it there, and uh, pick it up next time, Lord willing, in uh, Genesis 22. The Lord bless you all, and Maranatha.